Well, that sounds good to me. It's a long walk. I better go ahead and get started. <laughs> <laughs> it's 9.35. Danny, you want to start? I want to start. <clears throat> Does everybody else want to start? Yes, sir. Already. Oh. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Danny. <laughs> uh, I want to... Are the riddles here? Yeah, they're right. Yes. yes. Uh, I just want to warn everybody, and I know this, I don't know what you're going to think about this. We're going to be talking about some things today that may not be good for small children. So uh, if you have small children in your group there, you might decide that they need to Maybe do a little something else, or you can have a conversation later on to work through this. Uh, so I, everybody, uh, you don't have a worksheet this morning. So if you want to write anything down, I would encourage you to go ahead and get a um, some sort of a pad and some something to write something down with. You might want to do that. Um, we're going to make a little shift in our study this morning, um, and we're changing the title of our study. Oh, by the way, you need to get the Lord's Supper implements if you if you want to uh, eat the Lord's Supper in a little while. Um, so you re everybody remembers, right? We've been calling this Christianity simple or complicated, right? Yes. Yes. So we're changing the title as we move more into the actual Sermon on the Mount. We're going to change the title to Simple Christianity. Okay. I was talking to Mark about this last night, and he said, "Well, it's probably a good thing that you're changing the title because." You've spent 12 weeks talking about whether or not Christianity is simple or complicated. If it takes 12 weeks to talk about it, it's probably too complicated. So <laughs> that's wise. So uh, let's start, though, with a little bit of an opening question before we get into the, the deeper, heavier stuff. And I've asked my uh, nephew, Brad, to help me. Prayer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mother says, Prayer. <laughs> uh, let's let's start with a prayer. I'm used to Dale hosting, and so let's let's go ahead and start with a prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to be together this morning, even though it may not be exactly the way we'd like to be together. We thank you for the chance that we have to be together this way, and we pray that you'll be with us today as we consider some rather challenging ideas, and uh, as we seek your guidance in the things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, be with me. Help me to um, to state these things and to say these things properly and appropriately. And uh, I pray that as a result of our being together today, whatever else happens, that you will be glorified. Through Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. So is your interest uh, peaked? Yeah. All right. Hi, Brad. Hello. So, everybody, this is my nephew, Brad Fulfer. Uh, he is in Kentucky, and he, he loves to call me and tell me what the temperature is up there. When it's 100 here, it's 82 there. And uh, anyway, Brad, you have – Brad normally makes me call him Dr. Neff uh, <laughs> because he has a Ph.D., in fact, his wife has a PhD, so I'm not really smart enough to talk to them, but they do talk to me every now and then, um, and I appreciate that. Brad, what is your PhD in? It's chemistry. Chemistry, but that's it's, well, yeah. it's more than just a little chemistry, right? I mean, it's I mean not a little chemistry, but it's specific. so uh, solid state um, chemistry. It, that's basically um, different materials in solid phase, okay. physics of those, how they form together, what they do, stuff like that. Others say what's Kristen's, Kristen's also has a PhD, but and hers is in chemistry as well, but it's different, right? Yeah, it's uh, physical chemistry. So she specifically looks at light matter interactions. So she's looking at quantum interactions and stuff like that. Yeah, I spend a lot of time on that every day myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Matt has tried at times to explain to me what it is that he does and how, and, and 
have y'all y'all remember those 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 peanuts uh, cartoons you know when when charlie brown and and lucy when the kids are talking to each other they're they're talking right they're using words and stuff but when the adults start talking what do you what do you hear Wah, 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 wah. That's what, so Brad, I said, Brad, tell me about, tell me about what you do. And he says, well, basically what I do is I, uh, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I mean, I don't even, I don't even understand it, but I came across something yesterday as I was struggling with this lesson and what to do with this lesson today. And, uh, I, I, in the back of my mind, I remembered that there is something in academia or in the world of physics or, and Brad's going to help us understand this for a minute. Um, what is Brad, the theory of everything? Isn't there something called the theory of everything? Uh, there is. Um, so basically in uh, certain fields of physics, specifically quantum physics and, um, the physics that deals with uh, gravity and real weird light matter interactions, and light wave bending gravity, stuff like that called general relativity. Um, there are two different models. So what that means is you've got math that works for one set of problems that doesn't necessarily apply to another set of problems. And so the theory of everything, and if any of you have, uh, heard of Stephen Hawking, he was a big guy doing this work. Theory of Everything is a series, uh, it's basically trying to get the math to work so that you can go from talking about one area of physics to another area of physics using the same set of equations and um, it would make things a lot simpler. Now the way you've explained this to me in the past is, is the stuff that you do deals with macro, M-A, macro uh, physics, right? Yeah. And that those things have a certain set of rules. You know, if you do this, then this happens. If you do this, this happens yes. in macro physics, right? In the, in yes. the realm of, and I'm probably, I may not be, but, and then for instance, Kristen, she deals in the area of micro, M-I. Yeah, even micro. smaller so than that. Macro's big, micro's little, right? Yes. <laughs> and one of the things that you've tried to explain to me on many times and, and um, have left me drooling is that when, not because you can't explain it, but because I don't understand it, that in macro, there, we've had that sort of figured out for, for apparently for a long time and their rules and things happen and they make sense and all that. But when you get down to a certain size particle, an itty bitty like an atom, or something smaller than that, and you start talking about light waves, right? Then the rules that apply to macro don't apply to micro. Th weird in the, the way you've described it to me is strange things start to happen at the subatomic level that we don't see at the larger level. Is that, that's am I right. saying that right? That's right. Yeah, that's okay. correct. And so the theory of everything which they would like to, and how long they've been working on this for a while, right? I mean, basically, since they figured out, uh, like, when they, when they really started to get light matter interactions, when they started to develop quantum theory, that's when they, so, I mean, like, 1800s? <laughs> okay, so it's been a while. Yeah, and, it's been be, a and it would be wonderful, right, if they could come up with this quote-unquote yeah. theory. We don't really even know that it exists, though, right? Yeah, it'd, be, it, it'd certainly make things uh, simpler, less complicated. You'd be switching between models left off, less often. Right, because the macro guys could talk to the micro guys, and they would all be using the same math and all the same expectations and all the same. Yeah, right. but right now they can't do that, right? So there's no. almost a translation that has to take place. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Why in a world, in what's supposed to be a Bible class, on yeah. Sunday morning, when I bring this up, <laughs> well, okay. I remember I told you that that, that that we've moved from Christianity simple or complicated to just simple Christianity. And what I want to say to you about that, so it's sort of like what they're doing, trying to figure out to get this macro and micro stuff to to work out so that everything is is easier and simpler. 
because right now it's very complicated. They have to use two different forms of math and two different types of language and jargon. And they've got, you know, and it's difficult at times to translate between those two disciplines. And, and, and that's where we've been with Christianity. Is it simple or is it complicated? Uh, and, and what I want to share with you this morning, I think, you know, we've been working in this direction that Christianity, the way Jesus lived it, the way Jesus taught it, Christianity is simple. But at the same time, it's difficult. Now, that's a different word than complicated, mm-hmm. right? So Christianity, we, it, it, it becomes complicated when we aren't happy with the, simplest, the simple way in which Jesus presents it, and we want to try to apply it to things that we would rather do rather than things that he would have us to do. And so we start looking for loopholes. This is what, you know, this, lo, loopholes are a big, I mean, we, most of us that, you know, well, there's a lot of people, let's say most of us, there are a lot of people that hire attorneys and, and, and tax accountants. And what do they basically hire them for? To find the loopholes so that they can pay. You know, loopholes are huge. We're, we're all, well, we've always been interested in loopholes. The Jews, in the time of Jesus, we're interested in loopholes, in religious or theological loopholes, um, and ways that they, they understood exactly what God expected of them, but then they also had things they wanted to do, and they couldn't put the, those things, didn't mesh together well, and so they came up with ways around them, and I'll give you one quick example. In the Law of Moses, uh, as stated in Scripture, you were allowed to on, on the day, on the Sabbath day, you're supposed to rest. And so that would limit how far that you can travel on the Sabbath day. But if it, it, travel from your home, I should say that, okay? Well, the Jews realized that, how do you define home? You know, that was, you know, you always want a de- definition of terms, right? Well, a home is where your stuff is. Okay, so if I can travel, you know, 100 feet from my home on the Sabbath, and that's as far as I can go, because if I go any farther than that, it's considered work, and I can't do that. So the Jews figured out, well, you know, your home, that's where you, you know, we say the home is where your heart is, but the truth of the matter is, home's where your stuff is. That's where you keep all your stuff. And so imagine on the day before the Sabbath, if you needed to, you knew you were going to have to do something on the Sabbath day, that require that you get a half a mile or a mile or two miles away from your house, how are you going to do that and still keep the law, which says you can't travel more than, well, what you do is you, let's say you have friends every hundred, 200, 300 feet, whatever the, whatever it was that you were allowed to travel. And so you go to the, to that friend's house and you leave something of yours in their house. That's some of your stuff. And that becomes, I'm not saying all Jews did this, but some did. That becomes that new, that place where you put some of your stuff, an extension of your home. And so on the Sabbath, you could travel to that place. And then once you got to that place, you were once again at your home and you could go another however far. Well, so on the day before the Sabbath, you just go find those distant intervals, those distance intervals and place items that you own in those places and you can travel pretty much as far as you'd like to travel away from your home without legalistically breaking the law of Moses. Loopholes. We're all looking for loopholes. And um, that's been our struggle. Now back to the Sermon on the Mount. That's been the struggle with the Sermon on the Mount because the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount are very simple. Jesus says, for instance, um, love your enemies. Don't do evil to someone who does evil to you, but do good. Very simple. And then you say, yeah, but what if, and then you come up with a scenario, it's just horrible. And you, and that's, you know, say somebody's abusing somebody that you love. 
and you want it, you got to be able to stop that. And what if the only way to stop that is to kill them or to hurt them real bad? Well, does that fit into the category of doing evil or is that doing good since you're protecting? And so is Jesus saying, I can't really, you know, he says, turn the other cheek. So does that mean if you're hitting me, I got to let you, but if you're hitting my mother, I don't have to let you. And so now all of a sudden it's gotten difficult. Now I'm not here. I'm not going to settle that for you today. You're going to have to live with that. But I just want you to see that that's, those are, that's what's waiting for us in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, here's where we're going to get into some stuff that may be a little bit difficult to hear, a little bit difficult for me to talk about. And I'm going to try to do it as appropriately as possible. And I hope that I, I can do that. And I hope that God gives me the grace to do that. And I hope you give me the grace to do that. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Uh, the first story, and you're going to think, what do these stories have to do with one another? Well, hang on. Um, several years ago, eight, nine years ago, one of my uh, relatives who is, who is involved or had, at that moment was involved in a, a really wonderful ministry um, trying to help refugees get their green cards and get their legal status in the United States, refugees of, of, of war, um, re people that if they stayed in their own country would be killed. And so one of these, and, and they focused on some of the African countries and one of the, the church that, that they were in, involved with, uh, and one of the countries that they were working with was Rwanda. Uh, and I realize that you may or may not know a lot about Rwanda. You're going to know more about it before this Bible class is over with. But anyway, she, for whatever reason, she was down here in the Valley and she had some of those people with her. Uh, I guess she wanted to show them South Texas or whatever. And they actually stayed with mother and I here at the house. And one of these was a young man. He was probably 25 or six. Um, and they, they all spoke English, though they had a, what we would consider to be an African accent in our culture. They had an accent, but they were all very, very intelligent, very, you know, they're nice people, sweet people. And this younger guy, just, you know, I was talking to him back then, I played a lot of golf. And I was telling him, you know, hey, I'd like to, you know, I've been telling him about golf. And, and he said, I've never played golf. Now, you got to remember, these people were coming from, from, situations where they didn't have just the general, many of the general, what we would consider necessities of life, um, air conditioning, some of them didn't have water in their house, so, uh, things like that. And so the idea of golf, of course, <laughs> did not exist. And I told this young man, I said, you want, you want to, I'll take you to the driving range and, and show you how to hit a golf ball. Well, he was really excited about that. And we did that. And he actually did very well. He was a very athletic guy and very, you know, took very well to it. And then I, I said, now, right here at this particular golf course where we are, they're world renowned, maybe not world renowned, but anyway, very famous for their chocolate shakes. You want to talk chocolate shake? Well, he never had, he didn't know what that was. So we went inside and we had a chocolate shake, which he loved. And then, of course, me and my curiosity kicked in, and I said, so you're, you're from Rwanda, and you're trying to get into the United States. Why, why do you feel like you're, you know, what, tell me about Rwanda. Well, you, Rwanda is a beautiful country. It's very temperate. It, it's not super hot there. It doesn't get super cold. There, there are mountains. There are valleys. There's lots of water streams. It's, a, it's, on the, it's, it's sort of in the eastern um, uh, edge of, of Africa, of Northern Africa, uh, but it's not on the ocean at all. It's, it's an interior Africa and not a very big place, country, not a very big country. But anyway, um, he started telling me about these two tribes that live in Africa, in, in Rwanda. And one of the tribes was called the Tutsis and one of the tribes was called the Hutus and they had lived there for a long, long time together, but they didn't like each other very much. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, except that they, 
when I say they didn't like each other, they sort of hated each, they hated each other. Mm-hmm. And if he had stayed in Africa, he would have been the target for murder or for what we what was referred to as genocide. Um, and so he needed to get yes. Sorry about that. He needed to get out of there and, and was trying to get patriated to the United States, at least to get a green card so he could live here and work here. So that I got to, you know, I, I immediately came home and started doing research because I wanted to know more about this. And so I'm going to lay this on you real and, and, and here we go. You ready for a little, little history lesson on Rwanda? Mm-hmm. We're going to go all the way back to the 1930s. And then it was not considered, it was not the country of Rwanda. It was the kingdom of Rwanda. And one of these tribes, they were the ruling tribe. But at the same time, the other tribe was the majority tribe. Um, and the Catholic Church over a period of many years had, had focused in on Rwanda. And I remember Africa was, was polytheistic. Um, it, and, and there were many, many gods that existed in, in, in many, many different religions that existed. And for whatever reason, well, the, the Catholic, some of the Catholic higher ups made friends with the ruling class of Rwanda and they converted them to Christianity or Catholicism. And eventually, Rwanda became known by the end of the 1930s, Rwanda became known, and you can look this up, this is amazing stuff, as the most Christian country in Africa, with an estimated 90 to 90%, think about that, 90 to 90 percent of the people that lived in Africa, both tribes, who didn't historically did not like each other, by the end of the 1930s, claimed to be Christians, had accepted Christianity as their faith system. And now there's a lot of things that happened for the over the next 50 years, 60 years, but they still considered they were still considered to be. Um, and, and the Catholic Church would actually hold them up as an example of how evangelism could be done and an entire country could be won over to Christianity. It was, it was marvelous. Uh, and that's how they got to be known as the most Christian country in Africa. In 1994, we come all the way forward now to 1994. The president of the country was flying somewhere in his airplane, and it crashed, and it turned out that one of the tribes was trying to overthrow the government, and they did, and over the next hundred days, now this young man told me about this part and what this was why he had to leave um, Rwanda. Now, Thun, I want you to think about this. Get your mind around this, folks. And this is the part that I didn't really want the kids to hear. Um, over the next hundred days, 800,000 people were killed as one of the tribes tried to wipe out the other tribe. 800,000, and, and they weren't killed, and I'm sorry for this, the graphic nature of this, but it was not what we would consider to be a normal conventional war. They were hacked in the streets with machetes. A, a, a Hutu family might live next to a Tutsi family, and the family that was trying, and, and the tribe that was trying to kill the other tribe and they had been neighbors for 40 years, suddenly met their neighbor in the street and killed them with a machete. There were men, Tutsi men, who were married to Hutu women, Mm -hmm. and they killed their wives. They killed their children, 
in an effort to try to wipe out this tribe. I'm sitting there listening to all this from this young man over our chocolate shakes. And of course, I'm horrified, as you probably are. And, and he says, so I'm the wrong tribe. And I have to, I, if I go there, they're going to try to kill me. And uh, I looked at him for a minute and, and he had already, he, he was very proud of the fact that he shared with me that they were the most Christian country in Africa. And so I looked at him across the table and I said, so I guess they really, it really wasn't a Christian country after all. Well, you should have seen the look on his face. He was shocked that I would suggest that. And I said, well, Christians don't kill Christians over tribal differences or political differences or social differences. Christians don't, it, that's just not Christianity. The, it, it, they may have accepted the brand, the Christian brand, but they had not accepted the Christian lifestyle. Um, and of course, there's lots of passages of, of scripture to back this up. And one of the most famous is, by their fruits, what? You will know them. You will know them. One of the others is, this is how Jesus told his disciples, Jesus said, this is how you, people, will, people will know you're Christians. That's the way we would say it today. He said it. This is how people will know you're my disciples if you what? Love them. If you love each other. So people that are, that really understand and have been taught properly, Christians, now tell me, you know, fuss at me if I'm wrong here, but I just told him, I said, Christians don't kill other Christians. And he had never thought about that before. And a great big tear formed in one of his eyes and began to roll down his cheek. And he, and he said, I've never, I've never understood that before. I've never realized that before, but you're right. Now, most of us, I, I would assume, and I can't see you, and I'm, I mean, I, that's fine. <clears throat> Y'all know that. That's why you can stick your tongue out at me and roll your eyes and stuff, and I won't know it. But if you're like me, you're just horrified by the idea that you'd walk out one day and your neighbor would come at you with a machete, your Christian neighbor, and you're a Christian. Something's gone wrong there. Something is short-circuited there. Apparently, once again, they had the brand, but they didn't have the lifestyle. Do you understand what I mean by that? Everybody on board with that? Um, now that's horrifying to us. And yet, in, so I'll tell you another story. You're going to be more familiar with this one. In 1860, in the United States mm -hmm. history, anybody know what happened in 1860? Civil War. This is actually before the Civil War starts. Something important. Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States in 1860. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, you know, it's not important that you know the date, but that's that, that's just so you know. Did you know, do you remember that part of what started, the Civil War started very soon after that with the South attacking Fort Sumter. That was, they, the South struck first. But when Abraham Lincoln was, was elected president in, in 1860, he wasn't even on the ballot in the Southern states. Did y'all, do y'all remember that? Did you know that? He was elected president of the United States of America, but he wasn't even on the ballot in the South. So how do you suppose the Southerners felt about this newly elected president? Was he their president? Now, y'all know then, what happened next. Um, as horrible 
as what happened in Rwanda in 1994 was, it was pretty bad what happened here in the 1860s. Mm-hmm. Just to refresh your memory, two million Americans lost their lives. Two million Americans lost their lives in the Civil War. And while we can no longer, and I totally understand this, and some of us struggle with this and talk about this, say that this is a Christian country. Um, and a lot of the rhetoric you hear is that we we'll sort of want to try to get back to being a Christian country. And I don't know about all that, but I will say that in 1860, easily 90 to 95% of the people that consider themselves Americans, whether they were in the North or the South, consider themselves to be Christian. And yet, brother against brother, uh, father against son, family against family, North American against South South American, Southern American, the the Americas of the United States, went to war and killed each other. And in their churches on Sunday mornings in the North, what did they pray for during the Civil War? Victory. Now, we do that all the time in war, right? When we're at war, we pray for victory. That's understandable. When you're praying for victory for your side, what does that mean for the other side? Death. And and it's not just enough to say defeat. It's what? It's carnage. It's death. By whatever means necessary. Northern Christians, Northern Christians prayed for the deaths of Southern Christians. And Southern Christians in their churches on Sunday mornings, what did they pray for? Victory. And what were they praying for when they prayed for victory? Death and carnage in the North, Christians killing Christians. Now, folks, am I out of my tree when I tell you that, first of all, are you, are you on board with this idea that Christians don't kill Christians? Christians that really understand what, what Jesus called people to by your fruits, you will be known. This is how people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. People who love one another don't take up arms against each other and kill each other, do they? This is the history of of what it looks like. This is what happens in in a society and in a world where people read the Sermon on the Mount and rather than just simply living the way, instead instead of just saying, hmm, Jesus said it, maybe he actually meant it. Instead of saying that, it's like, yeah, but what if? Yeah, but what if? somebody wants to take my land. Well, what if somebody wants to take my slave? Well, what if somebody wants to, you know? Yeah, but what if? There's not a lot of room for yeah, but what ifs in, in the teachings of Jesus. We're, that's where we're going with the Sermon on the Mount. It's going to be real simple, but we're going to have to decide what we're going to do with it. Now, why in the world would I would I go there with this lesson as we shift from simple to complicated <laughs> folks? I can't see you. I hope you're not, I hope you're smart. Is anybody still there? Hello? Is anybody? 
Now I want to bring things home. Eight days ago in Portland, Oregon, a person who has political beliefs that would put them on the far right was killed in a protest, in a riot, whatever you want to call it, in downtown Portland by a person whose political beliefs would put them on the far left. On Thursday, that was Saturday night, a week ago, that man was killed. Thursday night, the federal agents in Portland, while trying to arrest this man on the left who had killed the man on the right, killed the man on the left. At the same time that that's going on in Portland, which by the way, last night, was there a hundred and second night of riots and protests in Portland, Oregon. Anybody ever been to Portland, Oregon? I've been to Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. I've been in downtown Portland. It was a lovely place. People were nice. Mm -hmm. Food's good. Coffee's real good. Salmon is good in Portland. What's going on? Okay. Let's move a little bit to the east in our country. A young man, a 17-year-old man whose, whose political beliefs would put him over on the right. He took his gun, his shotgun, and he left the state where he lived, and he went into another state, which was, happened to be Wisconsin, into another place where there was protests going on over stuff that we're all familiar with. And he killed two people whose political beliefs would have put them on the left. Now, I know, I know that that we probably can't call our country a Christian country anymore. I, I know that, that we'd like to, and, and some of us probably that are sitting here in this class would really maybe even have real, real problems with that statement that we can't call the United States of America a Christian country. Um, and I guess that could be up for debate. And even if you do want to call it a Christian country, what I would say about that is by its fruit, you will know it. That this is how you will know, Jesus says, that's how, this is how everybody else will know that you're my disciple. If you love one another, people that love each other don't meet in downtown cities and kill each other in 2020 in the United States of America. What in a, yes, I'm winding down. <laughs> so you guys know how my little messed up brain works, right? My, my imagination. And I'm thinking about all this and I'm thinking about, do we really want, do we really want to study the Sermon on the Mount? Really? Do we really want to challenge ourselves to go into that simple yet difficult teaching of Jesus? Do we really want to, as Jesus lie, lays out the foundations of what it means to be his disciple in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we really want to go there? Because if we do, all of us, whether you happen to be leaning in the right direction on the political spectrum or whether you need, or whether you happen to be leaning on the left in the left direction on the political spectrum, regardless of where you are, 
you're going to have to change. You're going to have to change the way you talk to you. You're going to change the way you talk to people on the other side. You're going to have to change the way you talk to, about people on the other side, the way you treat them, the way we treat them, the way we think about them. They will no longer be lazy, violent, bum, uneducated bums or holier than thou, overeducated with too much money elitists. We can't, that's not the way Jesus would have thought about them. And that's not the way Jesus would want his disciples to think about them. And so I got this little image in my mind. Tonight will be the 103rd. Oh, yeah, it's going to happen. The 103rd day in a row, a third of a year, nearly, where there will be violence in downtown Portland, Oregon, Oregon, USA. And so here's my weird little image, and I want to give it to you today. And I want folks, I want you to be praying about this, and I know you are, but I don't want you to just be praying like the South prayed about the North and like the North prayed about the South. That whatever you think, uh, think looks like winning, that whatever we think looks like winning, that we win, but that whatever looks like Christianity happens. What if tonight some special person who just has a wonderful ability to communicate and just a, a person who has a beautiful reputation without lots of negative stuff and what, what if that person could miraculously be lowered down into the, into the middle of what's going to happen tonight in Portland, Oregon? And for just two minutes, five minutes, this person could hold up their hands for quiet and all of the people on the right who hate all of the people on the left and all the people on the left who hate all the people on the right. If for just a moment, silence could descend on downtown Portland and this person, whoever this person is, looks around and sees the people with their rocks and their bottles and their, and their Molotov cocktails and their signs and their guns. In this moment of miraculous silence says, are there any Christians here? Are there any Christians here? Well, you know, you know that there would be some people on, in the far right group who there would be hands go up. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And over here on the far left, you know what? There would be people over there whose hands would go up and say, yeah, we're Christians. Yeah, and I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, Danny. I think Steve, I'm telling this story, okay, buddy? We'll talk about it. You and I can talk about this. You're comparing Christians to Christians that fight on both sides. And I understood the analogy in the war here, in the, the civil war in the U.S., and even the scenario in Uganda. But everything on the left that I can see, those people out there in Tifa, they hate God. They hate God with everything Steve, I got, everything, Steve, everything Steve, that comes Steve, out of let me finish and then we can talk. Okay. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody on either side, on one side or the other, doesn't hate God. Not everybody. They there are some mean, that don't. They you don't, don't know everybody, God. Steve. Not Look, I don't want to turn this into a heated, let me just finish this presentation for, and you can think what you think. Okay. Good job, right. Danny. Keep going. Okay. So this person who has the ability to not let what just happened happen, see that's not, that means I'm not that person, has this ability 
to ask, and, and there are people on both sides who claim to be Christians, just like there were people on both sides of the Civil War that claimed to be Christians, even though the people in the South said just what I what we just heard, that nobody in the North, everybody in the North hates God. You know, just like, that's just, that's, that's the mindset when you get to this point. But anyway, in the middle of downtown Portland, people do raise their hands and say, yeah, we're Christian on both sides. And then this person who has more ability than I do just to to speak his peaceful word says, what are you doing here? If you're a Christian, what are you doing here with that gun in your hand? What are you doing here with that sign in your hand? What are you doing here with that rock in your hand? That Molotov cocktail in your hand? What are you doing? Christians shouldn't be doing that. Now, regardless of whether you think that there is anybody on the right or the left who loves God or not, that's not the point of what I'm trying to present to you today. What I'm trying to present to you today is, look, I don't have any control over anybody but me. And I don't have any influence on very many people at all. But I am a member of a beautiful community of Christians, the Los Fresnos Church, and I haven't seen anything personally. I, I don't have Facebook. I've heard about stuff, but, you know, and, and, and terrible stuff that Christians have written about other Christians or about other people. Yeah. Um, if we are to continue on with this conversation about this, the Sermon on the Mount, then we're going to have to deal with don't do evil to those who have done evil to you, whether they're Christian or not. Don't do it. Um, don't judge. You've heard it say, said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Pay vengeance. You know. But I'm telling you, and you've heard it said, don't murder or don't kill. And Jesus says, I'm telling you, don't even hate. Don't hate those people. Because if you start down that road, you're headed for killing. Whatever your political perspective, whether you believe whether you're on the right or you're on the left, whether you believe that there is nobody good on the other side, doesn't matter. You're a Christian. And you're called to a higher, I'm called, we as Christians are called, called to a higher standard. By our fruit, we will be known. This is how everyone will know that we're Jesus' disciples if we love, if we love each other if we love people who have different opinions than we do. So I'm not presenting one side or the other when it comes to the right or the left. I'm presenting to you this morning, the Christian perspective. And that's where we're going with the Sermon on the Mount. If I may uh, interject here, Tom and I have spent, have gone to Rwanda for uh, seven times. And in those seven times, we have lived there for a year and a half in the country. And uh, they, we have experienced everything you talked about. We have had in our home here in Edmond, uh, probably 200 people from Rwanda as they have come through the states, have been at Oklahoma Christian uh, studying, we have had dignitaries in our home that have been involved in all of this. And um, uh, we have a neighbor across the street who is a Jew. And whenever he met one of the Rwandans that we adopted as our daughter, uh, he said, oh, are you Hutu or Tutsi? And he, and uh, she was 
stunned because she had never been asked that before. And I said, there, she is neither, she is Rwandan. So that is what they are trying to present now. Yes. A unified mm -hmm. country that is neither Tutsi or Hutu. Yeah, and, 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 and they're doing, they're making lots of, yeah. I'm just, did I do a, an, an appropriate job, a truthful job though, of portraying what happened in 1994? Yes, yes. So, and in a country where everybody claimed to be Christian. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's the point, uh, a, that's, the, that's the point. Right, as, a, as an update, uh, there is a Church of Christ in Kigali, which is a capital city of, right. of a million. And it is one of the most prominent churches there. And it is populated by Tutsi and Hutu and many others. And uh, the preacher there is uh, a, uh, a former Oklahoma Christian student, and he is from Edmond, and his family is still there. And um, uh, it is, it is very interesting. All of your observations uh, about the country are accurate. Mm -hmm, spot on. And uh, it has an altitude of about the same as Denver. Right. And, and so it's, it's, it's beautiful weather. Right. Well, the record highs are in the low 80s and the record lows are in the upper 40s. Right. So, uh, and it's, it's almost on the equator, so it's, it's the same year round. But, uh, but the church situation there is very nice right now. Um, yeah, and, that, and, and praise God for that. Yes. Um, so, Dan, you might have said it already, but what's the difference in a Tutsi and the, the other fellow? Tutu. Tutu. The Tutu. I mean, are the well, there, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question, and, but it's not really, I mean, yeah. It would take up time that we don't have. I mean, can you tell them apart looking at them? Yes, uh, one, yes the you can. Tall, the Tootsies are real tall. The Hutus are real short. They're not real short, but they're shorter. Mm -hmm. And the Tootsies tend to be a little bit lighter skinned than the, yes. than the Hutus. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, but once again, the point, don't, don't lose the point. The point is they were all Christians supposedly they all thought they were Christian. Everybody in the United States at the, during the civil war thought they were Christian. Look, look at the way they treat, look at the way we treated each other. Exactly. Let's we're on the, I, I'm not one of these uh, naysayers. I don't, I'm not smart enough to know what we're on the verge of in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. The point of this class, the point of our time being together and all of these things I presented to you today is this. We as Christians must be part of the pro part of the solution, not part of the problem. Right. And that means we don't do anything to make it worse. Um, and that's hard as we try to apply, apply the principles that Jesus states very simply in the Sermon on the Mount. It's just whether or not we can do that. Hopefully with God's help and with continued immersion in the word and leading from the Holy Spirit, the part of us that's angry, the part of us that's hates, the part of us that has made generalized judgments about the other part, whether it be the right or the left, hopefully that can, here, here, here's my dream, is that if we are all Christian, can the Jesus in me talk to the Jesus in someone else who has a different view of me than I do? And can we not hate each other and not harm each other and still work together to make a better world? That's the challenge of Christianity, of setting aside the thing I feel so, the, the, the political concept or idea that I feel very passionate about for the Christian concept that supersedes it. 
Danny, can I can I interject something here, please? Sure. Uh, your message for me personally was very timely. I've been struggling with this very thing myself. I just shared it with my wife the other day that I claim to be a Christian. But like Steve is saying, I look upon these people as evil. They don't love God. And God has to do a work in me to change that attitude. So your message is timely. Thank you. I've been very, I didn't sleep last night. <laughs> I've been nervous about this, but if I didn't, if I didn't love this church the way that I love this church, I wouldn't have said this. Well, we thank you for that. Yes. The message has to be love. I hear you say, you, that, that's the thing I love about you, Mark, is that you're so consistent with that. Mm -hmm. So, Read the read uh, read the read the Sermon on the Mount. We're changing hey, titles. Hopefully, folks, I hope I didn't offend anybody. Uh, I'm just speaking from my heart, and yeah. and that's uh, the struggle. If we all just speak from our hearts, is that helpful or not? And if well, our I hearts are shaped by Jesus, if our hearts speaking. are shaped by Jesus and His teachings, will our hearts speaking from our hearts? sound different these are questions these are not judgments or statements hey, Steve. Yeah. to be honest with you, you you are a little bit right because there is a group that say they're anti-christ but i don't think it's all leftist but there is a group that definitely hate hate god but i i don't think you're talking about all leftists baby <laughs> whose baby's on screen <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it's time for the, us to have the Lord's Supper. Mark, do you want to lead us through that, or do you want me to? Or how? Do, how do we, normally we talk about that beforehand, but we haven't had a chance. I'll be glad to do it. I'll do what I'm going to do in in church. Uh, you know, Sarah picked out some songs today that have to do with um, with love, and it, and it kind of fits in. <laughs> with what uh, you're talking about. Uh, one of the songs is, this is amazing grace. And, and it just says, this is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. And then she's, you know, we're, we're next going into um, how he loves. And then, uh, Immediately after our, our communion, we're going to talk, uh, how can it be, is, is the song she selected. And, and it says, you plead my cause, you right my wrongs, you break my chains, you overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be, how can it be, and, and the only way it can be is, is back to the love that I talked about. And, and so I'll, I'll leave it with that. Jesus had an unbelievable amount of love to when he's on that cross being ridiculed, being punished for something he didn't do. And in so much agony to say, I forgive you. Unbelievable thought when you think about what you just talked about and, and, not only right and left, but just our, our friendships and our world and our, our, our work life. And um, just something to think on is having that kind of love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the love that you showed and the love that you have for us to send your son and then Jesus uh, to not uh, call down legions of angels, but to take my place on that cross, to take my sin on that cross, to love me so much. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you, Jesus. Be with us as we partake of that bread that represents his body on that cross and the blood that was shed. We ask this in Christ's name, amen.
Well, thank you, Danny, and thank you, everyone. Um, you know, when we, we talk about things that are tougher to, to talk about, um, and we all have emotions about that um, from one degree to another, um, it's important because that's what a family does, is a family doesn't uh, ignore things that we need to, to be a pay attention to and, and listen to uh, everybody and all of our feelings that we have. And uh, some of them are, are rightly placed and sometimes we get, our, get those wrongly placed, but uh, it is good for a family to, uh, to make the tough dis uh, those tough discussions because then what we do is we come out more like Christ. And that's our goal is to, to be more like Christ and, and whatever that looks like for, for us. And, and so appreciate it. And it's uh, 1036, we're past. Um, service will be on at 11 uh, online for those that need online. For those that are here, uh, we'll see you here uh, until Wednesday night. Y'all have a great day, a great week. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Daddy. It was great. <clears throat>